Gracious Lord, we gather together this morning in the name of your Son, based on the promise of his presence, that when two or three are gathered together in his name, he will be in our midst. So we thank you, O Lord, that you are here, and we ask that you would draw us to you, that we would, even this morning, listen to the Spirit's pleading. Open our hearts and our minds to your presence. Work in us, O Lord, that which you desire. Speak to us, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. It's great to be with you, especially in the beautiful community of Crystal River and St. Anne's Church. I was here decades ago for the funeral of Howard DeForest Lockwood, who was a member of this community and whose son, Howard DeForest Lockwood III, known to his friends as Pete, was my senior warden at a church called New Covenant out in the suburban area of Orlando, Florida, where I was serving as rector at the time. Since then, I've done this very circuitous route from Orlando to Pittsburgh to Philadelphia to New York City, and now back down, and I was reminded of the cold weather yesterday <laughs> where I was in Jay Lambert's consecration in Eau Claire, Wisconsin, where yesterday morning it was five inches of fresh snow on the ground and 13 degrees. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, I'll take the fog on the highway this morning anytime. <laughs> so it's wonderful to be with you. You know, as I think about this, this is now... Let's see, one, two, three, four. This is my fifth post. Um, and it causes me at that point in my life, this is, as they say, a terminal position. I'm not <laughs> going to go anywhere. And uh, so I begin to start thinking about, well, what, what's been the fruit of what I've done over these decades? In other words, the, the question has to do with that term called legacy. What will your children say if asked? What was he like? Mm -hmm. Or grandchildren, or business associates, or your social friends, your retirees, those whom you, with whom you play golf or go fishing. What would they say about you? Because you see, that's in some ways the question that Paul is raising in the Philippian lesson. He is reflecting on his life and in some ways providing a kind of summation of that which really drove him. Paul's passion, as it were, that really informed all of who he was, particularly given the dramatic conversion, change of heart that had happened to him. So what I would like us to do is look at that and hopefully out of that ask some of the questions that the scripture by implication asks for us or of us as Christians in terms of the way we think about our own life. If I know that there are bulletin inserts, are there not that have the scriptures in them? Great, you've got one. Please turn with me if you've got it to the Philippian lesson this morning. Now, a little bit of background. Here's what's, in essence, going on. Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, the letter we call the letter to the Philippians, is a tender letter. It's as more self-disclosing of uh, really any of Paul's letters. There's a kind of tender-heartedness about his love for this particular group of people. But as you know, if you love someone, you want the best. You don't want them to settle for anything other than the full possibility of who they are and what, in fact, they can become. It, it's the kind of aspirations that you have for your children or your grandchildren or people that you, you love dearly because you know they could do better and you want that for them. And in some ways, what's happening here is that's coming out. Paul, in a very kind but pointed way, is making fun, in fact, sarcastically, of their, what he considers, oh, really not worth their time, aspirations. And that's where we pick up. He says... If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, what's he talking about? In other words, if you really want to brag about 
If we wanted to use our parlance before you went to college, who your forebears are, what kind of clubs you belonged to, what your business accomplishments have been, the accumulated toys of your life, cars, boats, things like that, houses. Let me tell you my credentials, he said. And what he does is that he lays out credentials, both social, religious, and academic, that are, to, to his audience, impeccable. It would be if you are an Anglo-Saxon saying, oh, well, I went to Harvard. My family actually came over in some of the earliest settlements. In fact, my mother is a colonial dame. I am a member of uh, one of the first families of the East Coast. I'm a son of the American Revolution, etc., 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 etc. And it becomes a point of distinction as in, see, I really am somewhat better off than you are. It's like the phrase that you hear from people about being in the Episcopal Church. And they say to those who have come lately, oh, well, um, I'm, I'm a cradle Episcopal. <laughs> and they say it just like that. As if somehow to mark themselves as, as somehow of a better and more distinct variety of human being. And see, that's what Paul is doing here. He's really trying to puncture that balloon by giving them his own credentials as a way of, by contrast, of where he's ended up as opposed to where he got started. And that's what he's doing here. If anyone has reason to be confident in the flesh, guess what? I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, meaning, in other words, I'm a Jew by birth. I didn't come into this late in life. I'm a cradle Episcopalian, as it were. <laughs> A member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, that distinct tribe that even God himself said, these I dearly love, if we wanted to quote the Old Testament. A Hebrew born of Hebrews. In other words, you can't get more authentically pure than this. Ethnically, I am above reproach. But it's not just a question of family background. It has everything to do with my own personal standards. Who am I? I am as to the law a Pharisee. In other words, I have done everything I can to uphold everything that has ever been asked of me. We would call someone like that a legalist. Paul would call someone like that pristine in his obedience. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church. In other words, all of those people who pretended to act like they actually belonged to the covenant of Israel, I knew better. I followed what my parents had told me. Even to the point of persecution. As to righteousness under the law, blameless. In other words, no one could point the finger at me and say, you did not keep that which was asked of you around the washing of foods and the keeping of Sabbath and making sure you obey everything. In other words, if anybody had standing, not just before you as a community, even before God, if I was worthy of God's favor, if that was the basis of it, which was human behavior, I'm there. <laughs> but look what he does. You see, what he's trying to do is say, if that's where you place your value, again, in our context, where you went to college, what your family is, what kind of things that you've accomplished and done. There's something, there's a terrible trap about that. God had to get a hold of Paul. Because you see, if we try to take that attitude in the church, it, it does several things. Number one, it makes us extraordinarily critical of other people. Because you see, we can't actually measure up to all of our own aspirations if we live in this realm either. We, we are driven perfectionists if we live in this camp. And there is something inside of us, regardless of our pretensions and the way we live on the outside, that understands that in our heart of hearts, we can't live up to what we're asking of other people either. <laughs> it's, it's really a quite, but we don't know what to do. It's a kind of trap, you see. Because if my value is in who I present myself to be to you, always keeping the best foot forward, you know, grace under pressure, 
I can handle everything. It's okay. We'll get through this. Then what happens inside is there's a kind of almost a self-hatred about it. So when I do something wrong, what, what do I say? Oh, I hate it when I do that. And it's more of a confession at that moment of how that person feels about herself, about himself. They know they're not keeping up even their own standards. But they employ that same kind of attitude toward others. So these are the people who are the quickest to judge, the quickest to gossip, the quickest to enjoy the little fall that somebody else has happened. Oh, did you hear what happened to Marie yesterday at lunch? And the reason is, is because it proves their point that they are, you see, slightly better. And that, above all, is the thing that is, in fact, important to them. That they maintain that pride of place. And it has everything to do with the way they've been taught. It's like that, did you ever see the old show South Pacific? There's this line, you have to be carefully taught. And that's what that's referring to, imparting a set of standards that if you do not uphold them, you are actually not being loyal to how you have been raised. And if other people are doing that, it's just because they weren't brought up right, you know? I mean, nod your head. You know what I'm talking about, don't you? Come on. I know. This is my childhood. And so God breaks through in an extraordinarily dramatic fashion. And Paul says an astonishing thing. They are not expecting Paul to say this in Philippi. Yet whatever gains I had, these things I have come to regard as loss. Loss? <laughs> no, no, no. That's your standing in the community. That's the thing that you uphold. That's the thing that cost, that sets you apart from other people. That makes you, as it were, a man of distinction, Paul. As loss? Do you really want to lose those things? Because of Christ? You mean if I come to Jesus? <coughs> I shouldn't care about these things anymore? That, that can't be right. Oh, and then he keeps going. More than that, I regard everything as loss, as loss, because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. And for his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. And that was true. That which he as a Pharisee Hebrew of the Hebrews, a man of tremendous distinction in his community of Tarshish, who was taught under Rabbi Gamaliel, the first, the first century version of going to Harvard or Oxford. All of that's behind him because he is now seen as an enemy of all of those things. Because he is now saying that the most important thing in one's life is not acquisitions, it's not education, it's not family background, it's not manners at the dinner table. It's not knowing about which piece of silver you pick up or who you know or whose name you can drop at a cocktail party. The most important thing now has everything to do with one thing and one thing only. And it has to do with saying, I am giving all of that energy that I gave to all of those things to only one goal. And what is it? It is to know Christ. A crucified rabbi. One that was thought by Judaism as cursed, because as the Old Testament says, cursed is the one who is nailed to a tree. I've identified myself with a religious figure who was publicly disgraced, naked on a cross. That's a sure way to get yourself kicked out of the local country club. <laughs> That's what he's really saying. All of that stuff, it just doesn't matter. I've considered it as loss. Because you see, I've discovered something new. And it's called the family of God. And that has to do with whoever you are, whatever background you've come from, whatever your race or how much education you have. What matters has to do with the fact that God has formed amongst us, Philippian Christians, 
A community of people who are learning how to care each other, care for each other, regardless of what your background is. Regardless of whether you know matters or not. Regardless of who you can name drop or what you have or don't have. In other words, the culture that holds us together as a community is not a culture based on acquisition. It's not a culture based on education. It's not a culture based on anything other than what binds us together of every tribe, tongue, people, language, and nation and background is one thing and one thing only. We are bound together by a common passion to know and discover the very man who was accursed before his people, but now, in fact, risen at the right hand of God, Jesus Christ. And he is the one to whom we are entirely indebted. All of the other debts that we have, we've let them go. They no longer matter. The only debt we have is to him and to the people who, in fact, are drawn to him. And so, yeah, I, I got kicked out of the country club, as Paul would say. I'm no longer welcome in the social circles I used to know. People look at as, askance at me when I show up at family reunions and they whisper about me behind my back. He has so much potential and he just threw it all away. <laughs> For his sake, Paul says, I have suffered the loss of all things. See, this is not hypothetical. We can talk very easily, I think too easily, actually, about the possibility of some social ostracism or suffering if we fully commit ourselves to Jesus. But I, I think for most of us, and I include myself in this, we if our hearts were really exposed, the truth of the matter is, is that we want it all, as it were, all this and heaven too. We want to be well thought of. We want to live with a level of material comfort. We want people to honor us for our accomplishments. We want to be able to enjoy the very good things that we have earned so well in the midst of the life that we have. We are grateful for the position that we have and the opportunities that we have been given to us. And we are going to take full advantage of them. Thank you very, very much. And I want to be loved by God and I want to go to heaven when I die. Right? And Paul says, I think that might be something of a Faustian bargain. Because you see, as one of the other epistles says so bluntly, uncomfortably bluntly, you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon meaning not merely money, but literally a system that values economic acquisition and the pride of privilege above everything else. That is the demonic system called mammon that keeps people enslaved to that economic system in a way that makes it impossible, in fact, to give generously and serve Christ. Because if you have to continue to acquire, where comes the possibility to serve those who are in need? The best I can do is a tip, thank you very much, or at least something that will allow me to get a good deduction on my income tax. And if I don't get that, maybe I'm not interested, because after all, I have to keep up. You see, that whole desire to keep up has everything to do with this mammoth demonic system that Paul says, you know what, I let that thing go a long time ago. And you know how I regard it? I, I have to be just dead to it. I, it's rubbish, as he says. Or actually in the Greek, it's a lot more colorful. Because when he says, um, for his sake, I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ, the word literally means human refuse. Done. Because why? Why would he say it with that kind of passion? Because he, and you know this if you've ever been caught into this system, which is probably at least 90% of the people in this room, is that it's alluring. It's always with you. We are those who in fact have been carefully taught. And we understand that it pulls at us pretty much all the time. And therefore, to live in a different kind of way that is genuinely sacrificial, 
so that no matter where I walk, whether it's into a restaurant or whether it's in my golf club or where, or the boat or whether I'm with friends, I'm not there for myself. Yeah, sure, I travel in those circles, but the fact of the matter is, is that if my whole goal is to know Christ and to gain his approval and to be his servant, that means that wherever I am, I'm his servant. So I might be there, and I'm not just there to be there. I'm there, God. Is there someone with whom I should pray? Is there someone who's in need? And I'm always listening, you see, with this, this other ear inside. Because I'm doing my best to pay attention to human need. And when somebody comes and sort of lays on me all the stuff of trying to be impressive, I know it's because there's a deep wound inside. That that's all, that's all they know. That's all they know. It's pitiful, really. And so, I forgive. And I ask for God to give me an opportunity to perhaps have a conversation about something that is of more value than their last trip or the thing that they bought. Because it's all passing away. It's all passing away. As the line goes, you can't take it with you. And there's something of far more value than any of those things. And Paul is saying, in essence, that's what I want my legacy to be. If you really want to play the social game, I'll beat your hands down, Paul said. But I don't want to play that game. We're in a different ball field now. Those are the old rules. They don't apply anymore. We need to think differently as a community of people. Our focus is Jesus and serving him. And he is the one who is willing to lose everything be publicly disgraced so that he might be obedient to his heavenly father and win for you and I the very salvation for which we are so profoundly grateful. And for that, I'm willing to let go of any Faustian bargain for the covenantal promise of God that is more than any other bargain I have ever known. It's challenging, these words, because Paul is not just writing them as if, now this is true for me and something may be differently true for you. He's saying, pay attention. I'm your spiritual leader here, and I want you to know that you're in a trap, and it's, you're, you will be the loser. Get out of the trap. Come and serve Christ. Find a way to say no to these other allegiances. Learn how to live in the midst of your others who might value those allegiances so highly in such a way that they might hunger for eternity rather than just the next acquisition, the next little piece of gossip, the next place where they can receive the compliment for the fine thing that they have done. Which is why Paul ends this section by saying, Therefore, I press on. I do not consider that I've had made it my own yet. But whatever I do, I forget all this other stuff. It's, it's gone. Whatever lies behind me, I strain forward to lie ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize. And what's the prize? Is to be fully united with the Jesus who loves me with everything that is inside of me, who knows the best and worst of who I am, who's called me to be his own, who's claimed me as his own, and who loves me and has forgiven me in a way that no human being ever can or could. And that's why I'm here for him. You see... That's the challenge of these words. That's in fact what's actually going to be acted out as we receive those who are being confirmed and received. Because the heartbeat of the promises that we will make together find their genesis in the very language of Paul's Philippian letter where he calls us to commit ourselves fully to Christ. They speak with different vocabulary but the same voice. So as we begin to shift from sermon to confirmation liturgy, don't go, oh, well, now that's over. Let's get to something else right now. But instead, I would, I would encourage you 
to as you listen to the promises that you are reaffirming, that you understand what is in fact being asked of you. It does create a new kind of humility where you sort of have to say, I will, with God's help. <laughs> because we know that otherwise there's no way we can do it. The allure of the old allegiances is far too present with us. But we are willing to say, God, extend your mercy. Change my heart. Work in me that which you desire. So that somehow by your grace, because as we said in the collect, you alone, O oh God, can deal and change the, old, the unruly wills and affections of sinners. All of us here, right? That's us. I need you to do that in my heart. So that wherever I am, here in Crystal River, or anywhere else, I'm yours. Let us pray together. Gracious Lord, we praise you first for your patience with us. We who are so double-minded. We do desire your favor, your forgiveness, your mercy, the promise of eternity, the companionship of your presence. We want to know above everything that, that we are in fact loved and accepted by you. But we also know how easy it is, O oh Lord, for us to take advantage of that love and acceptance and live really for ourselves and not for you at all. So Lord, help us to make good on the promises that we have made to you. Deal with our own unruly wills and affections. Break their power and draw us to you. That we might not only be yours, but that we might live as those who are yours. Wherever we are, no matter whose company we share, that in every situation and with all people, we might be, like Paul, your disciple. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen.